My name is Verity Tether. Um, I'm a PhD student at the University of Leeds. Um, as John said, I'm based in the School of Geography and also in Leeds Institute for Data Analytics. Um, my PhD is funded by the ESRC. And uh, just as a heads up, I'm not a statistician by trade. I am a geographer and um, doing my undergrad in geography and my master's in GIS. Um, but I'm here now to tell you about using agent based models to investigate patterns around crime clusters. So to tell you a little bit about what I'll cover today, um, I'm going to start with a conceptual background. So that is a background on environmental criminology as well as agent based modelling. Um, it's quite important for me to go through a bit of the criminology before we start so that um, the model can make a bit more sense. Um, and in terms of agent based modelling, I'm not sure if any of you have much experience of it up to this point, but I thought I'd start at a fairly basic level just to make sure we all understand what I'm talking about. Um, after that, I'll go through a bit about this research, so covering the research aims and then why agent based modelling was particularly appropriate for this work. Um, I'll then go through the models and give you a description of the models uh, before the results and conclusions. So, a background into environmental criminology. Um, it's a fact that crime is distributed neither randomly nor uniformly in geographic space. That is, um, we see crime clusters across all different spatial scales. Uh, this is a map of crimes in Leeds that I put together for my master's dissertation um, and showing that in the darker blue areas, that's a crime cluster. So as you can see, if you know Leeds well, um, around the city centre and around say Headingley Way, for example, there's quite a lot of crime. But as you go to the more rural areas, um, there are smaller, just little pockets of hotspots of crime. So in environmental criminology, the focus is on the offence rather than on the offender. So we look at the characteristics of where a crime occurred and when it occurred, um, rather than on say the psychology of the offence to try to understand why it occurred there and therefore then how to reduce it in future. There are a couple of key environmental criminology concepts I'm just gonna explain very briefly for you. Um, so the first one being routine activity theory. So this suggests that a crime occurs when and where the following three things converge. So that is a motivated offender, a victim, and an absence of a capable guardian. A capable guardian could be, say, a policeman or a CCTV camera even, or it could just be a chap walking his dog that puts someone off stealing your handbag. So it can be quite formal or informal. Um, in terms of uh, the other option is crime pattern theory, the other concept rather. Uh, this suggests that crimes are committed when a criminal's activity space overlaps with a criminal opportunity. Um, it suggests that everyone has activity space. So activity space would be, for example, the route you walk from your home to your work or to your supermarket. It's areas that you know quite well and that you use fairly frequently. And as I said, it suggests that crime will occur in areas where there's criminal opportunities in an offender's activity space. So as part of both of these theories, um, it was suggested in 1995 that there are two different types of crime clusters. So that being small, intense pockets of crime um, with two very distinct different causal mechanisms. So the first one is crime generators. Um, this is an area that lots of people visit for reasons unrelating to crime. So, for example, shopping centres and train stations and people go to crime generators um, as do potential offenders. They don't go to commit a crime, but they get there and then there's an opportunity and they can't resist. So they commit opportunistic crimes like pickpocketing, for example. And it suggests that crime generators become crime hotspots purely because of the quantity of people that are there. Um, and so there's just a lot of opportunistic crimes that occur. Um, it would be interesting to look at crime generators now in COVID time when there's kind of not pockets of people anywhere, really. So that's something that a lot of people are looking into at the moment. Um, the other example is crime attractors, and these are areas of a city um, that have a reputation for criminal potential and motivated offenders, so people who are suitably motivated to commit a crime, go to these areas specifically for that purpose. So um, examples are often red light districts, bar districts, drug markets, that sort of thing. So people go, as I say, suitably, offend suitably um motivated offenders go to these areas specifically to commit crimes and so that's why these areas become hotspots. Another uh, key idea for criminology, environmental criminology, is that of edge effects. I know this image is quite boring but um, edge effects suggest 
that the edge of an area has sees a lot more crime than the interior side of it. Um, to try to give a little bit of a clearer example, so this, for example, is um, is Leeds, and this the red line circles Leeds University campus. Um, edge effects would suggest that this red line, so the edge of the campus, would see more more crime than the central area, sort of where the blue dot is. Um, there's lots of different reasons for this. Um, one of them being, for example, that strangers and people who are there to commit crimes are much less noticeable on the outskirts because there's lots of people between the two areas. Um, although I know some people might question this, there is actually quite a lot of evidence for edge effects. Um, so as you can see here, there's a really clear drop as you get further away from edges. Um, so yeah, that was just a little bit of an introduction into environmental criminology. Um, now just to tell you a bit about agent-based modelling. So what is ABM? ABM is a class of models which are based on representing people, objects, populations at an individ individual level, um, which we can and we can then monitor their behaviours and their interactions through space and time. Um, to try to give you um, hopefully an accessible example, um, I don't know how many of you have ever played The Sims, but The Sims is quite a good example of agent-based modelling. Because in ABM, you model agents, hence agent-based, so people, for example, and you give them rules and they behave in response to these rules. Sims kind of do the same. So as you can see, my person um, from the bottom right-hand corner was quite dirty. So her rule says, if you're dirty, go and have a shower, which she is, well, she's gone for a bath, but um, she has responded to that rule that's in built in her. Um, Sims can also interact with their environment, so in this case the shower, or they can make themselves some dinner, uh, but they can almost also interact with each other. So as you can see, the father and daughter are chatting down, down at the bottom as well, um, showing that you can interact, as they with your environment and with other agents. Um, unfortunately, agent-based models themselves tend to be a little bit less snazzy than this. Um, so here's an example of an ABM. I believe this was also looking at crime. Um, showing agents moving around a road network around an up part of a city. Um, as you can see, you can include things like GIS files to include more specific environments. Um, and this can help us look at, for example, where might people meet, where might crimes occur. Um, I've seen ABMs looking at like traffic flows, that sort of thing, to model, as I say, individuals as part of a group and that sort of thing. Um, to go through a few of the strengths and weaknesses of agent-based modelling, uh, this is just the selection of a couple. So in terms of the strengths, um, very simple assumptions can lead to very complex patterns. Um, the models that I'm going to show you later, as I say, very simple assumptions, but, lead, but more complex patterns can emerge as a result of these assumptions. As a result, they're really helpful in theory testing. So you can um, include purely the mechanisms which are part of your theory to see whether the results that you're expecting emerge from that. They're also really useful to test ideas which couldn't be tested in the real world. So um, I think one of my colleagues, for example, is using agent-based modelling to look at um, police resource allocation. Um, so for example, you can test um, what happens if we don't give this police force any resources, what would be the implications of that? You obviously couldn't do that in a real world, so it, it can be quite a good idea for testing initiatives um, to see what the potential implications would be. Additionally, it's very flexible. Um, the, code, the program I use to code this is very easy to code. It doesn't take a coding genius to do. Um, so it can be used and you can add so many different variables if you want to, to create very, very complex models or very, very simple ones. In terms of the weaknesses, um, it can be challenging to separate out the actual results from the impacts of certain parameters in your model. Um, particularly if you make your model more complex, it can be quite hard to identify. So that's why it's very important to validate and verify your model results. Um, they also can be quite difficult to reproduce um, because of all the different variables and elements that can be quite personally coded by, by the producers of the models. Um, the book that this work is being published in um, which I'll give you details on at the end. We've been asked to submit all of our code so that our code can be look, looked at as part of the as part of the book itself, which I think is a really good idea to improve reproducibility. Um, but I'm not sure how many other ABM pieces of work and how many other ABM publications are doing this. Um, additionally, um, it can be quite difficult to quantify complex components. Um, I have quite a good example of this later on for you. But um, as everything in your model has to become quantified, it can be quite difficult to do that. 
Um, you can use lots of different data sets and literature searches, but at the end of the day, some, some things are actually just quite difficult to do that with, which I'll explain shortly. Um, additionally, um, ABMs can't be used specifically to test a theory, but to examine the extent to which it's possible. So I know I said they are helpful in testing theories, and they are, but to me, it's really important with ABM work to not say, my ABM has produced these results, and therefore, this um, this theory definitely is right or definitely is wrong. But to me, it can be used, as I say, to check whether it would be possible. So now to tell you a little bit about uh, the project that I have been working on. The research question was, do the mechanisms behind crime generators and attractors lead to the emergence of edge effects? So that being, do uh, the mechanisms behind the two hotspots I've, I mentioned earlier see um, increased crime around their edges or rather around inside, like in the center of their spaces? Um, so why did I decide to use agent-based modeling for this? Uh, again, this I suppose is part of the strengths of agent-based modeling. So firstly, um, one of the main reasons is that data on offender motivation is very limited. So um, from the descriptions I gave of the crime generator and crime attractor spaces, um, you might have noticed that the main difference between the two of them is offender motivation. At uh, crime generators, offenders are fairly opportunistic. The crimes that are committed, um, they didn't plan them, but they saw the opportunity and kind of went for it. Whereas at a crime attractor, offenders go specifically to those areas for that reason. Um, although some papers have interviewed offenders to get data on their motivation and that sort of thing, as a rule, it's not easy to get that sort of data. So um, simulating models, such simulation models such as this can be a good way of exploring these ideas. Um, additionally, um, identifying crime generators and attractors in the real world can be challenging. Um, because, for example, some areas which, although they could be known to be crime generators, so uh, tra train stations, for example, are a classic example of a crime generator. Um, they could also then sort of become crime attractors in their own in their own way. So, for example, a tra train station, uh, most people who go there are going there to, to get a train. So they are going there for reasons unrelating to crime and opportunistic crimes occur there. So that would be a crime generator. But over time, the reputation of that train station as a potential source of pickpocketing uh, victims could increase and therefore turning it into an attractor. So it is very difficult to separate out the mechanisms of a specific place. Again, that's why an ABM is so useful because we can identify purely those mechanisms for each model. Um, as well, identifying edges can be challenging. So although in the example I gave of the university campus, that's got quite a definitive edge, as do, for example, park edges or edges of shopping centres. Um, edges can also be quite conceptual. Like, for example, if you think about your neighbourhood, would you be able to specifically identify the edge of your neighbourhood? That It can be quite challenging, um, especially for researchers who don't necessarily live in the areas they're researching. Um, again, an ABM can be used to uh, specifically create an edge in an abstract environment. Um, and finally, not all crime generators and attractors produce the same patterns. So although um, one crime attractor might suggest um, empirical evidence of edge effects, that doesn't mean that the mechanisms behind it would do. Um, that could just be that one crime attractor. So um, testing these theories in a, in, in a model um, enables us to look at this relationship. So um, to go on to the models that I created, um, to give you a heads up, uh, these are all abstract environments, so they do look a bit uh, messy to begin with, but I'm going to talk through each of these spaces. So, uh, to start with, this was my control environment. Um, as I said before, it can be difficult to identify what results have come from um, the mechanisms you're testing and what have come from uh, just as a result of your model uh, coding. So I created a control model, which has purely random movement, so that I could identify any future results that occurred in my other models are a result of the mechanisms, um, because we can compare against this control model. So I'm going to go through each of these components. Um, hopefully you can all see the little red cross um, in the sort of upper left hand corner. Uh, that represents one of our offenders. He um, in the real model, I had a lot more, but I've put just one just for ease of understanding it here. So we have just one um, offender 
and he is sat on his home node. So he has been given one home node. Um, the white dots, which are scattered across, are referred to as navigational nodes. And the best way to, to consider these would be uh, like transport intersections. So the offender will move in a straight line between each of these. And when he gets to one, he randomly decides which, of the, which one he's going to head to next, turns to it and walks towards it in a straight line. Um, as well as these navigational nodes, there are also routine nodes. So as part of the environmental criminology theories I mentioned before, um, people have routine nodes and routine places that they go to most frequently. So for me, um, outside of COVID, obviously, this would be um, work, uh, the supermarket, like my best friend's house, for example, would be my routine nodes. Um, and so our agents have routine nodes that they visit more frequently than the other navigational nodes. And then as well behind this um, is the crime opportunity back backdrop. So the lighter patches, the, the small rectangles, the uh, squ squares rather, the lighter patches have more crime opportunities and the darker ones have fewer crime opportunities. As I've said, this obviously represents a fairly abstract environment, um, but this is the best way that we can think of to properly model the crime generator and attractor mechanisms. So to introduce my generator model, it's a very similar model, um, but as you can see, hopefully from the in, on the inside, because of the lighter patches, there is a small band, uh, like a strip going down the centre of more crime opportunity. And in here, all of the nodes are routine nodes. So all of the nodes which are in this central strip are visited more frequently than those outside. This is particularly useful and particularly obvious then how it's modelling crime generator mechanisms when there's a lot of agents in the model because they spend a lot more time in the crime generator space. And the crime generator, to just remind you, um, is the space like a shopping centre that lots of, visit, lots of people visit for reasons unrelating to crime. So they're all in this space. They can leave the crime generator, obviously, but they visit the generator more frequently than the outside space. And then in the attractor model, we have the same central band of increased crime opportunities. Um, and to remind you, the crime attractor is the area that offenders visit when they're suitably motivated and when they want to commit a crime. Um, and so in this model, the offenders uh, move around the environment as they would in the control model, but they have a variable called motivation, uh, which is coded into them. And this is the same throughout all three models, apologies. They all have the motivation variable. Um, but with, in the attractor model, when the motivation variable crosses a certain threshold, they will go specifically to an attractor, uh, a node in the attractor area and commit crimes both there and potentially en route there as well. Um, just to give you an example, I've uh, blown the offender up, so hopefully you can see him a bit clearer. Um, so he's left his home node and he is walking over to a node. And then he's uh, he heads back home because they are coded to go home more frequently. I'll run through the um, the movement mechanism shortly. Um, as you can see, it's designed like a torus, so um, they can go up and through all the walls. Uh, this meant that they didn't all cluster in the centre of the model, which was skewing the results quite a lot. Um, when there's loads of agents on here, you can just see them all dashing about. So yes, this is uh, this is how they move around. That took me ages to get that code working. Um, in terms of node selection, so when, when the offender gets to a node, they then have to decide on the next node they're going to go to. So this is again still part of the movement. Um, you can pro I programmed it so that you could decide how frequently the offender visited a routine node. Um, so if it was like every one trip, every two trips, for example. So if the offender was not selecting a routine node, they would just select any node at random across the environment. But if they were selecting a routine node, there was a greater probability that they would go home. So um, there'd be 60% chance that they would consider going home. However, if they were already home, they would pick a different routine node. But if they weren't home, that's where they would go. If not, they would just select any random routine node. So this was the case in the control model, the crime generator model, and the attractor model, as long as the offender's motivation was less than 75, as you can see on here. So this uh, bottom two thirds of the flowchart, that's the same as on the previous slide. But if the offender's motivation was above 75, 
So you would select a random node in the attractor area and go to that instead. Um, this is a really good example of um, the limitation I mentioned before about uh, limitations of, uh, rather of complications of selecting quantification ideas for, for these sorts of concepts and how to quantify these concepts. Um, it was very difficult to try to identify a value that you could use as um, quote unquote just uh, enough motivation to go to commit a crime. Um, so 75 was selected fairly arbitrarily, but um, as I say, a lot of testing was done to to look at different um, different values for this uh, variable and to see what the effects of that would be on the model. And this was uh, deemed suitable. So as the offenders, so this cover, what I've covered so far is basically the uh, the movement. Um, but now onto the offending. So as the offenders move around the environment, there is a probability that they would commit a crime. So the probability that they would commit a crime at a certain place and at a certain time is a product of the probabilities that they are suitably motivated at that location and time, and that there is suitable opportunity at that location and time. And then this was multiplied by a scaling factor to scale it down a bit, a bit evenly across the environment. This led to crimes being committed um, quite a lot, depending on what the scaling factor was. So when it was uh, scaled back down, it was a more manageable amount to analyse. Um, in terms of the simulation experiments that were run, um, I've put a slight typo in that first one. So it was a thousand simulations per model. So 1000 different environment setups per model. Um, this was done randomly. But the same environment was tested each time for the control, the generator, and the attractor models, um, and run each time for each one. Um, there were also 3,000 iterations per run. Uh, 50 offenders moved through the environment. There were 250 navigational nodes, and 10% of these navigational nodes was allocated to each offender as a routine node. So they would get a ran each offender would get a random 10%, a random 25. Um, and in this run, uh, a roti node was visited on each trip. Uh, we decided that was appropriate because um, 25 routine nodes is still quite a lot. Um, I think I, I would struggle to think of 25 places I go to uh, routinely, but uh, this lined up quite well with the theory. Um, in terms of how we analyse this data, um, so if this is uh, an example of one of our models and there's a little zero, um, a little circle on the patch when a crime occurs on it. So I created transects that went along each step across the x-axis and counted how many offences occurred along each step on the axis. So um, along the first line on the left there was one offence down that transect, on the next there was two um, and so on and so forth. This enabled uh, me to create um, scatter plots um, so we can see the progress along the x-axis. So to go through the results. So this firstly is the scatter plot for the control model. As I said, um, this shows the count along each transect along each step across the X axis and shows the average crime count across the model runs. As we can see, crime um, doesn't experience any hotspots in these areas. So we can see that any uh, in this model rather. So we can see that any results which we see in the generator and the attractor models are a result of those mechanisms rather than uh, the model itself. So this is very promising. I was very pleased to see this. So this is the results for the crime generator. Um, the red line represents the edges of the crime generator space. As you can see, um, inside the crime generator, we see a peak of crime, a steep arch, a peak of crime within the very center of the space. This suggests that edge effects, um, which we're looking for, certainly don't seem to be occurring according to this model, um, because it's almost the opposite of what we would expect to see. If edge effects were occurring, we would see peaks around the red lines. Um, it's also interesting to note the um, patterns exhibited outside of the crime generator, whereby the amount of crime we see seems to uh, decline as you move further away from the generator space. Um, this is a well-known uh, concept in environmental criminology, distance decay. Um, so the fact that this model produced distance decay is, is promising and potentially interesting. 
Um, I also created this sort of uh, choropleth map. Um, so imagine that we're looking down on the model, like on the board from above, as we were when I was showing you examples of it. Um, and each patch is coloured by its crime count. Um, this was a way to just make sure there wasn't anything strange going on that transects were hiding. But as you can see, uh, the patterns appear fairly even and decrease slowly as you go from the centre out towards the edges of the, of the whole space. Um, but I, again, as I say, the edge effects don't appear to be visible here. Um, in terms of the crime attractor model, um, this graph shows both the generator and the attractor model results. So the generator model is in dot is uh, little circles, um, and that shows the the steep arch in the middle and the graduating uh, curves on the outside. Whereas so the attractor is the triangles, and that shows like a fairly flat line on the outside and a fairly flat line on the inside of the attractor space as well. Um, this also suggests the crime attractors and the mechanisms behind them don't seem to lead towards edge effects either because there's also not much of an increase around the edges, in fact a bit of a decrease, but this is uh, far less severe than for the crime generator. It's also interesting to note that outside of these spaces the model uh, has predicted that the results are fairly similar to the control model, so um, there's a fairly even distribution of crime outside of the crime attractor. And again, um, to go through the attractor model uh, choropleth map, um, it's a fairly boring map because that central band is just grey, but that shows that there's not too much fluctuation inside the attractor and fairly even distribution um, on the outside, potentially a little less in the corners, but not too much to be uh, too concerned by. So to conclude, Go back to the research question. Do the mechanisms behind crime generators and attractors lead to the emergence of edge effects? Uh, this model has, well, these models have suggested that they don't. Um, as I say, if um, the if edge effects had been visible around these crime attractor and generator um, mechanism models, um, we would have seen peaks of crime around this red line around the two edges, and we haven't seen that at all. So we we can conclude that this model suggests that they don't emerge. Um, so what are the possible implications of this research? Um, a, a bit of theory testing. As I say, we can't um, uh, conclusively say that edge effects do not occur around crime generators and attractors, but we can suggest that it doesn't appear that they would do. Um, it's also quite useful because um, research into the mechanisms behind crime generators and attractors um, is, is quite limited, so it's useful to explore these mechanisms. Another potential useful thing from this research, which wasn't one of the aims, but is a, a very helpful implication, is potentially classifying generators and tractors in the real world. As I said, it can be quite difficult to tell them apart empirically, um, but now we have this model that suggested that there's two very distinct crime patterns, both inside and outside of crime generators and attractors i.e. the crime generator model suggested that uh, distance decay might occur and a steep arch as you go towards the centre of the generator space, whereas the crime generator didn't suggest either of those things. So it could be interesting to look at empirical data to see if those elements are visible. Um, if this is the case and if we can identify generators and attractors, we could use this to tailor policing strategies to these spaces. So, as I said before, um, the key difference between these two spaces is the offender motivation. And so I think it's safe to assume that the policing strategies which would be required to police these two areas would be quite different. The policing strategies you would need to try to reduce opportunistic pickpocketing would be quite different to um, someone specifically going to deal drugs, for example. So if we can specifically identify these areas, that could be very beneficial. So the future research, um, one thing will be the empirical research that I've suggested, um, looking at the ways of potentially uh, classifying generators and tractors using these results. That's something hopefully I'm going to move to um, in the next stages of my PhD. Um, but also to develop these models. As I said, they're quite simple mechanisms and quite simple uh, models that have been built. But um, one such de development could be, for example, to allow the offenders to interact with each other and to um, to well, steal from each other, maybe, or commit interpersonal crimes, which haven't been included in this model. Um, and to end, I'd just like to end with a, quite a famous quote. Um, I think 
a lot of you might be aware of this, um, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Um, I absolutely believe this is the case. Hopefully this model will be useful to give us a spring um, a springboard for, for future research, but absolutely, as I say, should not be taken as, um, as absolute truth that this is the case, that the results that I've identified are, are the case. Um, just and finally, as a shameless plug, so this uh, work has been published in a book, um, Agent-Based Modelling for Criminological Theory Testing and Development, which I believe will be out um, at the end of November. I'm not entirely sure, but if so, it's an amazing stocking filler, obviously. Um, and just if you're interested to read a bit more about the research, you can see this work in there. Thank you so much for listening. Um, my email address is at the bottom there, so if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them now, but also feel free to get in touch. Um, it'd be great to hear from you. Thank you so much. Yeah, brilliant. Thank, thank you very much, Dorothy. Um, I've got an echo now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. I'll, I, can, yeah, I can mute it, maybe. Um, I, 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 sorry, I can see that there's a, a question from Kieran. Um, in, in the comment box, I, I had a, a, um, a slightly sort of po poorly thought out question, which is whether, whether, whether there's, it, is it the case that there's more than one type of edge? Um, because I think as you work through the, the, the empirical example you gave of sort of putting a red line around the Leeds University campus, um, that, that sort of made sense as an edge in, in the real world. Um, because obviously people inside that are students going to lectures and things, and people outside that are uh, maybe not students, but people going to pubs and things. <laughs> so it sort of makes sense empirically. But in, in, the, in the sort of simulated model, you're also making a, um, a simplifying set of assumptions, and there's, there's, there's sort of high, medium, and low areas. Um, I'm not quite sure what the question is, but I'm just wondering whether there's, is there more than one type of edge in the in, in the theory, in the, in the criminological theory? Oh, sure, yes, absolutely. So, um, as you said, there have been some, some edges that are, are quite distinct and quite clear, like some people even suggest that, say, rivers around an area can be considered an edge, uh, which is obviously very, very distinct, um, whereas others are much more fuzzy, they're more um, conceptual. So those ones particularly are much harder to, harder to model and harder to study, um, but also very interesting. Um, I do agree this uh, this model gave quite um, quite hard edges, uh, but that was partly because um, it seemed to make sense in terms of the examples that we were looking at. Um, so, for example, you'd see the edge of a train station. Um, but I would definitely be open to experimenting with different sorts of edges um, to see if a, like a softer edge maybe would also produce similar results. Great. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, yeah. So, just just picking up some of the, the questions in the uh, in the comment box. So, Stephen Clark has, has asked, um, well, is, is is there evidence that offenders um, have a tendency to target locations close to their home or further away from the home? I guess is the flip, flip side of the same question. Yeah. Um, sure. Um, well, so it does depend. Um, there's definitely evidence to suggest that offenders commit crimes in areas that they know well. So, as I say, that might even not necessarily be um, areas close to their home, but if, um, if say, they, they work in the next city, that area is still something, still an area they're aware of and they know well, and there is evidence to suggest that that's the sort of place they, they would offend. Um, in terms of targeting locations close to their home, um, I think it has been suggested that it, would, it depends on the crime. So, uh, there's a concept called like the commuter or marauder theory of, of different types of offenders, commuters being people who go a bit further out, I believe, and marauders staying closer to their home. Um, this isn't my area of specialty, but I believe uh, that research into this has suggested that um, some sorts of crimes are committed more close to home. So I think like burglary can be committed closer to home because, for example, um, the houses near them look similar to their own house. So they understand um what what sort of door they might have what sort of windows they might have um the sort of the movements of people in that area at that time so um yeah the the long short is it sort of it depends on depends on the crime it depends on the offender but um yeah as a, as a rule it's more likely to occur in places that offenders know not necessarily near their home but near somewhere that they're aware of yeah Sorry, I'm just to myself. Sorry, sorry, thank you. Um, 
And and Kieran's questions. Um, so in, in in the in the modelling, did, did you find that uh, fewer assumptions were better or, or more assumptions? Well, so for me, um, I preferred fewer assumptions um, because, as I say, I was able to know specifically that the results we saw were results of these um, simple mechanisms. So the mechanisms I built into this model are um, the fundamental ones for crime generators and attractors. So kind of the the core concepts of these of these environments. Um, the more, to me, the more assumptions and the more uh, more components you throw at a model, the higher probability something will go wrong or that something will happen and you don't really know why. So um, personally, I don't think there's a need to make a model more complex than it needs to be. Um, but there are people who, who disagree, um, who would rather throw loads of assumptions and loads of variables into their model. Um, and again, there are benefits and, and limitations for both of those. But to me, I, w I wanted to be able to be sure that the assumptions that I made were, were reasonable and they, they were all backed up by uh, environmental criminality literature as well. Okay, thank you. And then uh, so final, final question, I guess, is uh, we, we, what software do you use? Um, I used NetLogo for this one. Um, Particularly if you're thinking of experimenting with agent-based modeling, I really would recommend NetLogo. It's um, quite easy to use for programming. Um, I have done some um, modeling in Python, but um, yeah, I, I preferred NetLogo. The interface is quite nice. And um, yeah, that's what I used for this one. Great, thank you. Um, and I just did an observation that then from, from Kieran that, um, Oh, so a few observations now from from people. So um, yeah, so jo jo Joshua Epstein's work um, agrees that fewer fewer, fewer assumptions are, are better, and that's linked linked link to um, the concept of, concept of Occam's razor, I, I guess. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It's a good point. And uh, yeah, love love the NetLogo's turtles as well. Uh, that's what NetLogo <laughs> refers to the agents as. They're called turtles. And I, I have a pet tortoise, so I'm I'm a big fan of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and just just a, what, I think one quick question before before we submit, move on from from Paul Paul Darwin, who's asked, asking whether the is is the is the model focused on lower level crime like burglary, or or could could it be used for would would it have the same application to more serious offences such as you know, violence, you know, robbery, murder? Sure, it, it definitely could do. Um, so my one is probably for more lower level crimes. Um, as I say, it's quite an abstract concept of these spaces and concept of crime. But in terms of using agent-based modelling, uh, like developing this model potentially for these, um, the lower level crimes absolutely would work. One thing we have, it's much easier to get data on things like burglary um, from police forces and that sort of thing. So it can be much easier to validate your model using data if you're looking at those sorts of crimes. And in terms of more serious offences, um, they can be harder to examine in environmental criminology because, for example, with, with violence, um, as an example, they are, um, to, to me anyway, they're a lot more psychologically based. Um, so although environmental criminology has looked into uh, violence and robbery and rape and that sort of thing, it's, um, to me, it, the applications of the model would require a lot more specific components than this one but I think it definitely would be would be doable. I will will apologize for the for lack of COVID in this talk um, basically uh, most of this work was done last year and uh, I've been uh, I'm an intensive care consultant at uh, Bradford Royal Infirmary so I've been uh, on the front line of COVID and not had a chance to do very much else uh, else this year so it's uh, it's, a, it's a little bit out of date. I have put some references in there just uh, to to try and talk about uh, we are using this kind of modelling a little bit um, around COVID, um, or that the main model is as I was 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 set up um, uh, prior to this. Um, so yes, I, I'm Tom Lawton. I'm uh, an intensive care consultant at uh, Bradford Royal Infirmary. Um, a, a little bit sort of fish out of water talking uh, stats to knowledgeable people, but uh, I, I used to be a computer programmer, so uh, I'm, I'm reasonably happy with numbers, and, and that's how I've kind of got uh, got involved with this, and, and how I pretend I know what I'm talking about. Um, so hopefully everybody here um, is, is is already happy with why we need to do modelling. Um, this uh, originally. 
came out of plans to try and model our intensive care units, which um, at the time had 16 beds. Um, and it's very, very tempting to say 16 beds, 365 days, that's how many bed days we can model. But um, you, uh, you can't just neatly provide 5,840 patient days of, of care because patients don't arrive on demand. You can't sort of neatly slot them together um, or treat them like a, like a fluid. Uh, unfortunately, there will be gaps and uh, modelling gives us a chance to try and uh, look at that and, and sort of give a, give a bit more of a realistic approach to how things, um, how things come together. Uh, again, people have talked about the, the different kinds of uh, modelling and uh, we've just had a great presentation on uh, agent based simulation. Uh, but a, a quick recap, um, at least so that uh, uh, you understand the way that I, I use the words. Um, discrete event simulation is uh, the one that I'm most used to um, and how we built our, our hospital model. Um, in this case, you have uh, entities moving between states um, and the, the model is primarily driven by um, the uh, consumption of resources. Um, as the entities move between different states, they will require a, a resource and the resource may not be available, in which case they have to, to queue for it. Um, you are modelling at an individual level, so if your entity is a patient, you're modelling individual patients moving around. Um, it's uh, commonly used um, with, uh, with a Markov chain uh, type setup, whereby um, people have a, a patient has a, a random chance at each um, tick of the model of uh, moving um, to, a, to a new state. Um, but uh, what we describe and I'll, I'll be talking about is, is more of a, a data driven approach. Um, system dynamics modelling, um, and I lump time series in here, I'm afraid, um, but that's where we treat um, we treat things a bit more like fluid. Um, so um, uh, much more sort of mathematically um, based um, and much more amenable to being uh, sort of solved. Um, it's a, a deterministic modelling setup because um, you, uh, I say you're, you're essentially um, uh, describing the numbers uh, according to an equation. Um, you can have hybrid approaches with discrete event simulation um, or agent based simulation, um, and uh, you can have um, a, more of a, a stochastic setup, but generally speaking, system dynamics models are, are more likely to be deterministic. Um, and then agent based simulation is. To my mind, at least, I know people say it seems almost arbitrary the, the difference between discrete event simulation and agent based simulation. In, in agent based simulation, um, it's the, the agents themselves that are active and where the sort of the, the processing of the, the model um, lies rather than the servers. Um, however, as you'll see in terms of model, you could, you could argue that uh, there's some, some agent basedness to it as well as, as the uh, event side. Um, and I've had to sort of slightly shoehorn uh, something that was designed for discrete event simulation to, to allow it to be more agent based. Um, so in terms of the background, um, we had a successful um, ICU model, which is uh, described in the, uh, the paper down there at the bottom, um, using what we feel is a, a relatively novel technique, which we, we like to call modelling without statistics. Um, the, the reason we call it modelling without statistics is that uh, Traditional um, efforts to to create models um, seem to involve trying to reduce individuals down to components and probabilities to say build a Markov chain. So if you're building an intensive care model, you have a, a probability of the patient being admitted to intensive care. You have a probability of them deteriorating and dying, um, a probability of them um, getting better, a probability of them requiring this, requiring that, etc. Um, and you have to take all of your data and try and distill the individuals down to two components um, and then take this um, sort of set of components um, and use that to, to build back up to your model again. Um, we thought we would be so we would try to find ways of doing this without trying to reduce individuals down to, to the component level, um, mostly because um, certainly on an intensive care unit, um, the population is just so heterogeneous. You have people who are um, 
uh, in the, the level three pot. So level three is people who are intubated, not a ventilator. And they might be there because they've just had a really big operation and tomorrow they'll be awake and then the day after they'll be up and about and, and, and on their way home. Or they might be in the level three pot because they've come in with, with COVID and um, you know they could still be in the level three pot 60 days later. And it wouldn't be right to um, model that level three pot as a, as a single entity because the, the patient's don't fit together. So you end up trying to split those pots into, into multiple different pots. And I saw a um, a paper where they tried to work out how many different sort of pots you had to have in order to model an intensive care unit. And you ended up with, with so many pots that uh, almost every single patient was in their own in their own pot. And um, to us, we thought, well, well, why not just just keep them as individuals and uh, try to to run the model with the patient still being being individual. So we've got this approach, which is kind of analogous to a, a bootstrapping of the of the sample um, and running that bootstrapped sample back through um, the uh, the model to see see what what happens. Um, the challenge was to try to scale it up to run an entire hospital, which is what this this project was about. Um, running it on a single intensive care unit with uh, 16 beds and, and 12 nurses was, uh, um, yeah, it was a, an interesting challenge. Um, but uh, if you look at the, the source codes available publicly on GitHub, it's not hideously complicated. Um, scaling it up to an entire hospital is is definitely hideously complicated. The, the source code is also available. Um, I, I apologise for anyone who tries to look at it, uh, but people have. So um, project aims. Uh, we wanted to base it on routine data sources. We oops, sorry, well, let's skip past. Uh, we wanted to base it on routine data sources um, rather than our new electronic patient record. Um, we wanted to try and do it with open source code, um, particularly because we are we're good friends with the, the NHSR community. Um, and we wanted to demonstrate that the, the technique we'd um, modeled our ICU with could be scaled up to, to an entire hospital, which uh, some people uh, doubted. And uh, in retrospect, uh, I probably should have listened to them. Uh, we then wanted to try and use this for hospital planning uh, at Bradford and try to promote uh, use of the technique across the, the whole NHS, um, which, uh, as you'll see, um, we've, we've had some success with. Um, although uh, uh, 2020 has been uh, a little bit different. So uh, the modelling technique, well, it's mostly data driven. Um, we do have to do some sort of traditional modelling um, and that's around the inputs. Um, the uh, arrival of patients into the model um, has to be done by uh, more traditional methods and uh, at the moment the model uses a, a Poisson slash uh, exponential process and um, I do think that uh, that might be a little bit sort of under dispersed for the way that patients arrive in reality and uh, COVID-19 is a brilliant example of that. Um, if uh, one person comes in with a uh, respiratory illness caused by a virus it is quite likely that other patients will come in with a respiratory illness caused by that same virus. It's um, unfortunately the nature of, uh, of patient care. However, an awful lot of conditions are independent and uh, appropriate to be modelled that way. Um, one of my uh, colleagues is, is looking into better ways of trying to um, model inputs to, to models like this. But for the moment, I think that the Poisson process is, is, is considered to be fairly standard for this sort of thing. Uh, once we have a patient uh, arriving into our model, then we need to sample um, the demand that that patient will generate. And this is where we turn to real data rather than trying to actually model a patient and, and have a sort of purely hypothetical patient. We simply take a real person um, who actually came into our hospital in the last, um, I think we're using two years worth of, of, of data in there uh, or three years worth, sorry, three years worth of data in there uh, and push that person through the model. So we know um, what that person came in with. We know um, what services they required in the hospital. Um, and there's some uh, difficulty potentially around the way that we um, govern that person's interaction with the system because the system that generated the data may not be exactly the same as the system that we're modelling right now. Um, for example, in um, the winter months and with COVID-19, 
um, we are having to put patients with respiratory illnesses on surgical wards. Now, if we have a patient brought into our model who in reality was on a surgical ward, it is not necessarily the case that what they wanted or needed in an ideal world was a surgical ward. So um, we've had to try to pick apart the diagnoses of the patients and create these trajectories so that we know what the patient would ideally have had um, were it were it possible in, in an ideal world, um, and then um, use a rule-based system to work out actually what is what is available um, and what are they going to receive um, in our model. And then we repeatedly generate a single year um, using a, a you know, Monte Carlo type effort to um, start seeing um, how this how this works out and uh, you know, what the what the situation looks like and, and what happens to the patients. And in terms of the data sources we use for this, um, so uh, ADT data, um, very common data feed of um, patients moving around the hospital. Um, it says where patients are um, and uh, you know, where they have moved to. Unfortunately, this is, is one of the big problems. I, I just mentioned that uh, if a patient is on a surgical ward, we have no idea that that was because they needed a surgeon or because there just wasn't anywhere else to put them. So we decided that wasn't, uh, wasn't perfect. Um, SUS data um, is probably one of the main currencies of, of secondary care data, uh, and it's a brilliantly rich data set. Um, for some reason at Bradford, we found it only contained the first four wards of each patient's journey, which is apparently something to do with, with, with contractual <laughs> reasons. Um, but luckily, it did contain all of their diagnoses and which services they were under, and actually Although initially we thought this was a, a particular problem, uh, not knowing what wards they actually went to, we quickly, real, quickly realised that <coughs> it doesn't matter what wards they actually went to because we are really interested in what wards they, they should have gone to, which is more related to which team they were under. Um, we have this electronic patient record at Bradford. Um, it's wonderful, it's massive, it has huge amounts of data, but it's not a universal currency and we wanted to try and make sure this model could be used elsewhere. Um, Cerna data is also a quite complex when we've when we've looked at it, and uh, it's not exactly easy to unpick um, and try and work out exactly what's going on. So we we ended up sticking with with uh, SOS data. Um, we have connected Bradford at Bradford, which has uh, a massive amount of information. And interesting is actually where I got the SUS data from because um, we had uh, pseudonymized SUS data uh, available in connected Bradford. Um, we didn't make use of the linkage simply because, again, we wanted to make sure that um, the data set we were using was something that would be relatively easily available for this um, model to be repeated elsewhere. Uh, in terms of the coding, um, I had never coded in R before. I barely even used R, um, apart from my, uh, helping out my sister when she did a, a, a stats course uh, a while back. Um, so I was a bit scared of it, um, but uh, we promised we were going to do this and I was going to try and teach myself um, how to. Uh, we looked at, um, I, I just kind of immediately assumed that the best way to do this would be to write it in my, my new programming language, but I, um, I very rapidly discovered that uh, R is not like most languages. Um, I'm a, a, an imperative programmer by background, you're much more familiar with uh, C++ and, and Assembler and, and I say Python, but I don't mean Python in the in the way that uh, data scientists use Python. I'm 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 talking about you know Python, Python as, a, as an imperative programmer using loops and all sorts. Um, using R for stats was was brand new to me, and I discovered that raw R is absolutely brilliant for very standard distributions, but uh, it's not brilliant for um, for this kind of modeling when things start to get a little bit more complex. Essentially, I've discovered if, if you're ever using a loop in R, then you're probably doing something wrong. Um, there is a package called DES, um, which is designed for this, but the package itself was written in R. Um, and when we started playing with that, we found it was incredibly slow. Um, certainly some of the, the original models, uh, when I started writing them, um, I remember the first couple of times I kind of assumed it had crashed. And it was only one time when I uh, I got a phone call um, dragging me away in the middle of doing some writing and returned two hours later and found it had actually completed. 
that I realised it was it was more of a problem with with how the code was running than um, that it that it simply didn't work. Uh, RCPP, uh, as a former C++ programmer, I was very, very tempted and I promised I would use this as little as possible. Um, did end up using it a little bit, I'm afraid, but, uh, but you know, uh, we, we tried to avoid too much of it. And then RSIMA, which uh, is what we did end up using. Um, it's, it's brilliant. If anyone wants to do any um, DES type modeling in R, I would highly recommend it. Um, it's got a brilliant uh, uh, community associated with it. Um, the author is massively, ridiculously responsive. And uh, the fact that it wasn't initially designed to build models um, in this way, um, over the course of the year that we were doing this project, it has become very, very able to, to do this kind of modeling. Uh, the particular issue we had with it was that it was designed more for uh, sort of telephone queues and things like that, whereby if someone um, is waiting for a resource and it isn't available after a certain amount of time, then they uh, drop off. You know, it's the equivalent of someone in a telephone queue hanging up and they disappear and we no longer care about them. Whereas a patient who is waiting for a bed, um, they can't just disappear. It's not allowed. Um, we have to we have to put them somewhere. Um, so um, that was one of the major changes that ended up being made to our SIMA was having a kind of exit trajectory so that uh, we we never lost a patient. God, that sounds bad. Sorry. Um, our SIMA has the concepts of um, trajectories, um, resources, um, and arrivals. Um, so uh, an arrival arrives, they go down a trajectory which defines what resources they're going to ask for, um, and uh, they will queue for the resource if, if necessary. The, the server is the, the thing that provides them with, with that resource. Um, I won't go too much into details um, of exactly how our SIMA works, um, but uh, it's it's certainly worth a look at if you ever want to try um, DS in, in R. Um, that's a very basic trajectory. Um, that's not one of the ones from the um, model we built. Um, and there's a nice uh, function in our SIMA that lets you um, uh, put a graphical representation of it, which is incredibly useful for debugging. Uh, particularly when your trajectories actually look more like this. Um, that's a trajectory for one of the patient types um, that we had in the model. Um, and that's a, a zoomed in version showing all of the different uh, um, things that, that the patient does as they loop around around the system um, before, uh, before finally exiting. Um, so the workflow, um, the patient, the real patient episodes are analysed to um, determine what trajectory to put them on. We uh, had discussions with clinical staff, um, advantage of being one myself is that, that that was relatively easy, and defined 55 different trajectories that uh, would sort of determine how a patient behaves. Um, patients can have more than one trajectory per admission um, if they change care during the course of their admission. Um, and then we have specialised care areas, um, particularly that means the intensive care unit, although we also at Bradford have a, a ward or 21 um, where we have a sort of slightly higher acuity of patients. And those are added to a linked list that uh, can be sort of brought in um, as a uh, running alongside the main trajectories. Um, admissions, as I said, it's a, it's a Poisson process, but uh, we tried to index it by, um, well, we we did index it by whether the, page, the admission was elective or emergency. Now, um, it's a bit debatable as to whether we should be using a Poisson process for elective admissions, which are inherently controllable. Um, worryingly, we found that in reality, um, elective admissions aren't well controlled and they are actually fairly random, which was disappointing because we hoped our surgeons would be uh, a little bit more um, organized in terms of making sure that they weren't uh, just sort of bringing in what was available. Um, this is something that we found in the intensive care project as well and, and, and speaks to a need to uh, to be a bit more organized around our, our, our surgical planning. Um, we also looked at uh, uh, indexing it by um, time of year, um, time of day um, and uh, whether or not it was a, a business day. Um, we didn't. We were looking at, but didn't end up modelling specific holidays and things like that because we found that, that whether it was a business day or not seemed to uh, model things reasonably effectively. And then for uh, each patient admitted, we select a real patient. This bit, I'm afraid, we had to do in RCPP, um, which essentially uh, does partial matching on uh, the patients. It just creates uh, 
a random order of literally the thousands and thousands of patients we have in our database and searches for a, a partial match, the first partial match. Um, so effectively, we've selected a, a random partial match from the entire list. Uh, for admissions, uh, elected patients, i.e. patients uh, who are having operations that we can potentially defer, um, if there isn't a first tier bed available for that trajectory, then um, that operation is deferred, um, which will go down as an on-the-day cancellation. In an emergency, we, have, we accept that we are going to have to bring the patient in, so um, we have the wards for each, each of those 55 trajectories ordered from most to least appropriate. And uh, if there are no beds at all, we hold them in accident and emergency. Um, the hospital will not close. I asked the uh, managers at the hospital uh, under what conditions will we um, refuse admissions to emergency patients and put the hospital on divert. And uh, I was told in no uncertain terms that this will not happen. Uh, in fact, um, it did happen uh, a couple of weeks ago um, as part of the, uh, the second wave uh, pandemic. But uh, we went on divert for two hours. Um, and I think two hours during the, the peak of the second wave um, for the whole, you know, it, it, it's, it's apparently the first time it's, it's, it's happened and, and hopefully won't happen again. Um, so inpatients, um, we uh, go down the trajectory. Each of the 55 trajectory has these uh, tiered locations and uh, every time we change trajectory, we review the current location of the patient and try to move them to the most appropriate location that's available. Um, critical care, we have to model separately, um, and uh, those the, the patients retain their underlying trajectory, but will temporarily relocate to a, a critical care, i.e. intensive care unit area, or this um, part of Ward 21 that we had as a, uh, a, as a separate sort of high acuity area. Um, the data appears separately in, in the SUS data. It's uh, the CCMDS critical care minimum data set, so um, we kind of pull that in as a, as a separate uh, as a link, link list. Does it work? Um, so here, um, slightly complicated chart, but the um, blue line is the modelled bed use. Um, black uh, and on the background of the uh, red dots, which are um, the individual data from the individual uh, model runs. The black dots are real bed use and the grey bars are the range of real bed use. Um, I think you can agree it's not bad. There's clearly something funny happening around April, which I'll, I'll get on to um, in a minute. Um, the, it, it looks like in reality things are probably sort of slightly more dispersed than in, uh, in the model, and I think that probably goes back to the, the Poisson process issue that I was talking about earlier. Um, the that blip in April, um, I spent ages uh, trying to work out what was why it was happening and trying to work out how to get rid of it. And I'm very lucky that I kept telling people about it and saying I really don't understand why this is happening. Um, this was back in in sort of March uh, 2019, and uh, it, it then went and happened um, in real life. The the black dots uh, don't include the the um, actual 2019 data. Um, so, uh, so sort of, it was it was quite nice um, to have that uh, uh, sort of validation. I'm, I'm still not entirely sure why it's occurring. I I, I have my theories, um, but uh, it was so it was nice to be going around saying I don't know why things are going to get bad in uh, in uh, sort of end of March, beginning of April, and uh, for it to to really happen. You will notice that the bottom part of the graph talks about 2020, and this is unfortunate. Um, we, uh, it, it, it is effectively a resampling method and what it is really telling you about is what would have happened in various counterfactual scenarios. It is not an attempt to predict the future. We simply put all of the predictions into the future so that it was very, very clear that, uh, that you know, the difference between past data and, and, and the, uh, the model runs. Um, so yes, it looks like uh, things were uh, incredibly bad. Um, uh, 2020 clearly has not uh, panned out like this. Um, but uh, in terms of uh, modelling the, the the hospital as it was before the pandemic, then uh, I think it's it's reasonably good. Um, if we look at uh, on the day cancellations, um, we can see that uh, the model um, seems to predict a slightly higher value for on the day cancellations than than reality. And I think a lot of this is because 
in reality, if you know there's absolutely no chance of a patient having their operation tomorrow and the patient, the operation is going to have to be cancelled, then you will phone them the night before. And, um, you know, partly because it's it's better for the patients and partly because it means it doesn't go down in your on the day cancellation numbers, which is a, a metric by which the hospital is is judged. The model doesn't do that. It will simply cancel them on the morning of surgery. So that would explain why some of the numbers are, are a little bit higher. And um, if we do some uh, resampling on the uh, on the real on the day cancellations, we can see a bit more of the, the distribution there and see that, uh, um, yes, essentially, it, it seems to be getting the numbers roughly right and the range roughly right. But uh, it is is probably con consistently overestimating, which uh, I think is due to that. Um, a density plot of, of on the day cancellations, um, again, seems to be a, a fairly decent match for reality, except um, around April um, 2020, well, sorry, not April 2020, except around April uh, 2019. Um, and uh, I think, uh, again, a lot of that is because um, when the hospital was, was very full, then there was um, the early um, postponement, early cancellation of surgery. We've had periods where we have um, actually stopped elective surgery for a couple of weeks um, to try and, uh, and and catch up and uh, and allow us to deal with with acutes. And obviously, that's something that we've we've had to do a lot more with with COVID. Um, so the real use of the model is looking at scenarios, um, and these are a, a couple of scenarios that we tested and uh, looking at outputs in terms of on the day cancellations. Um, this this has then been used for sort of planning by the hospital. I won't go into the details of exactly what the scenarios represent, but uh, the advantage of the model is we can look at various different outputs, for example, not just on the day cancellations, um, but we can look at exactly why um, operations were cancelled, were they cancelled because there weren't ICU beds available, because there weren't these uh, high acuity beds on Ward 21 available, um, or just not enough beds, priority one beds available in the hospital. Um, were there delays getting people acutely to critical care um, and uh, which parts of critical care did they um, occur in? And that's particularly important because most modelling um, that I've seen in the NHS just models one specific part of the hospital, whereas this model gives an opportunity to see the effects of a change on the whole hospital and, and how it all works together, which I'll get onto in a second. Um, capacity planning, we can look at the magic hospital, um, an opportunity to dissect it by saying, well, what happens if we have an infinite number of beds? Um, these are the kind of patients that, that we get in. Um, and this is our critical care unit occupancy. We can see that uh, it sort of hovers around 10 to 12 uh, beds occupied, which is great because we've got 16, which is enough to cope with most of the peaks there. Um, and it gives you uh, the opportunity for, for planning uh, availability of beds. Um, you can look at the, the big specialties. General surgical beds are obviously sort of fairly constant throughout the year, um, apart from dips around Christmas. Um, geriatrics is something that we see much more of uh, in the winter. Um, and you can see there that uh, the, the winter peak um, carries on right into April, which is, is something that uh, um, wasn't sort of well, and, you know, everyone talks about Christmas and winter and actually especially unfortunately for COVID, this, this does seem to, to run right on. Um, this, this graph obviously is, is completely inaccurate uh, because you know, we predicted that we would end up with uh, uh, 30 odd respiratory patients in the hospital. Um, as I speak, there are 165 uh, just with COVID um, on top of all the normal respiratory patients. Um, but you can see those uh, Interestingly, two um, winter peaks of respiratory illnesses that, uh, that, that the model predicts, um, and uh, a nice rise um, in uh, hepatology referrals in uh, October to December, um, as uh, presumably people start uh, drinking for the winter months. Um, and again, interestingly, COVID seems to have uh, caused a lot more of, uh, of the drinking. We did a case study of uh, the development of a perioperative unit, which was designed to look after patients having high risk surgery for the first 24 hours um, and people having more complex operations, such as esophagectomy, rem removal of the esophagus for cancer uh, as a step down to take pressure off critical care areas. Um, if we run it as a magic hospital, we can see that we need kind of, you know, maybe four beds, uh, five, six to cope with, with peaks. Um, but the real question was where those beds might come from. 
And uh, if we do the kind of uh, target on, on, on the day cancellations, we can uh, see that uh, it's obviously best if we just make brand new beds um, and not so good if we take them from elsewhere. Now look at scenario 7D, which is already the worst scenario. This is this is where we take beds off uh, Ward 21, our other critical care area, to create this um, uh, perioperative unit. Um, and again, it doesn't look brilliant um, from the point of view of, of uh, ICU admissions. Um, but this was a, a scenario that people were actually planning on bringing in um, last winter. The really nice thing about this model, as I said, is it shows the impact of changes on the rest of the hospital. And here we can very, very clearly see um, that uh, because you've taken the beds from Ward 21, Ward 21, that critical care area just grinds to a halt. 7D was, was not a good idea. And when we reported it, uh, luckily that didn't end up happening um, in the winter, um, hopefully as a result of, of this model being um, taken seriously. So yeah, I didn't mention COVID-19 and, and this model was created before COVID-19 was, was even a thing. And this is a major issue with this modelling type. And to be fair, most modelling types, because um, they are uh, effectively um, sort of you know, resampling type methods. You are looking within, interpolating um, what's been going on, and you're um, not necessarily able to cope with these weird and wonderful events that might suddenly occur. Um, I guess with, with this kind of modeling, you could you could resample respiratory patients, you could um, create artificial cases, and you could inject these into the hospital uh, and see how that uh, might work. And in fact, we have done a little bit of that. Um, in the summer, when we wanted to try and get elective surgery restarted, then we were able to use this model to um, predict the number of beds that we needed to uh, ring fence in order to try and get, in this case, uh, orthopaedic surgery restarted. And interestingly, um, some uh, uh, experts um, in uh, Cologne in, in Germany have uh, started using um, some of the open source code I, I uh, put up to try and do some uh, COVID ICU modelling. Um, and they sent me this uh, last night, which was uh, an attempt to model. Um, I sent them some some Bradford data, um, and uh, they're, they're modelling the the rise of COVID and uh, the way that the uh, the beds are used um, by the the different bed types. So, in terms of success of the project, um, we did manage to base it on routine data sources. We mostly managed to do it in R. There's a little bit of RCPP in there. I'm very sorry. Um, and we demonstrated that you can scale up the ICU technique um, to cover a whole hospital. Um, although, we, so we had to put A and E as an input rather than actually modelling A and E itself. Um, we have used it for hospital planning at Bradford. It did predict that spike in March. It was used for various uh, modelling efforts um, before COVID hit, and has been used actually since since COVID. And we've worked hard to try and promote this across the NHS. Um, albeit, I haven't managed to do quite so much this year. Um, but we've created a teaching package which is available on GitHub. My username on GitHub is figure T H I double G E R, um, and uh, it's it's on there. Um, we've made improvements to our simmer. Oh well, Inyaki Ukara has, has made improvements to our simmer based on on our feedback, and uh, uh, you know, thank him very much for making it useful for this sort of modelling. Um, and uh, pre-COVID, NHS England had picked it up um, in the hopes of uh, making use of it. Um, and by bringing it to, to other hospitals, and we'd started work with, with Adel to use it there. Um, we want to keep spreading this te technique and we want to keep using it, um, and I'll happily talk as much as, uh, as anyone likes about it. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think there's, there's a lot of potential for this kind of technique based on, on routine data. Um, and thank you to the Health Foundation for funding this, and thank you to the massive number of people who, uh, who helped me uh, build it. Thank you. Oh, oh, I brilliant, brilliant. Thanks. Thanks very much for that, Tom. And uh, uh, yeah, I like, like the diagram at the end as well. <laughs> I was trying to explain to my son how a wire train chops rather than just continually pulls out smoke. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, 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 it's a good, good, good question to try and, try and answer. Um, <laughs> Um, so I, 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 I again invite everyone to into comments on on the on the uh, on the comments box. I, I, I had a, a sort of series of 
probably well, fairly sort of ill-informed questions, really. But um, in part prompted by the sort of last but one slide said you, you'd um, you'd been speaking to NHS England, and I was sort of, I was sort of thinking as you as you worked through how, how many parallels there are with this and, and you know, on work on on the model hospital and the the, the idea of um, having um, sort of an idea of a sort of super efficient hospital that works. Um, um, but very efficiently at every sort of step of the process, um, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm just I was just wondering how how, how much this aligns with that that sort of work and that that, that um, it's a very sort of indicator driven approach. Yeah, I mean the the advantage of the model is that you can um, dissect it in in multiple different ways, and uh, you know because the the model literally has or they were real patients, data from real patients moving through it. Um, you can attach markers to anything that you want to look at and um, try to uh, and, and see any variable that you're interested in. Um, we even talked about sort of trying to create a, a, a graphical version of it where you can physically see the patients moving around. Um, so the, there's, there's opportunities to test all sorts and, and look at anything that interests you in terms of uh, patient flow through a hospital. And I think that that's what's interesting, because particularly around winter pressures, people come up with weird and wonderful ideas that you might want to try to look at um, responding to winter pressures and, and try and prevent them becoming a big problem. But nobody is willing to try something too wacky because, you know, you've only got one shot at it and you don't want to make things a lot worse. Um, the the advantage of the model is you can do something really stupid and you're not going to you're not going to hurt anyone well, yeah absolutely um yeah i know so, so various attempts to we, we always attempt to model next winter uh, and, and we try to do it in sort of uh, may may and june so that we get ahead of the game um, but it never, it never quite seems to work um the um so, so the, the other sort of random question for me, and I'll, I'll sort of pick up the comments in the comment box, was um, that the, 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 the patient traje trajectories seem quite complex, and I, I wondered how, how how much that they, they, they were sort of fixed in the model, or whether whether um, you know, what, did did you leave open the possibility that the tra trajectories might be slightly different if if the if the hospital works in a slightly different way. Uh, so um, the, there are 55 different trajectories that the patient can be on at any one moment, plus they can kind of move sideways from a trajectory into a critical care area. Yeah. Um, each of those trajectories has um, four different priority layers of what, what the patient would like, ideally. So priority one is this is a perfect place to put someone. Priority two is this is okay but not brilliant priority three is we're in trouble here and priority four is yeah you can do it if you really want to um so um it's it's relatively easy to change um it's it's, it's easy to add new trajectories to the system um, and the patients will behave differently depending on how full the hospital is and what's available to them um, but they will have to go somewhere um, there's another folder, an, another file that contains um, the wards and resources that are available to the patients and um, has a there's a ward controller who operates um, to open open up surge wards and surge capacity and things like that um, when uh, when it becomes necessary. So the model is fairly responsive to what's going on and we've I've tried as much as possible although this was a proof of concept rather than designed to be used in other places. I've, I've tried as much as possible to pull the Bradford specific stuff out so that it's it's more easy to use in other places. Yes, excellent. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm just going to pick up a couple of comments from, from Catherine Barnaby, um, which includes one of the questions I was going to ask actually, which was um, whether the, the, the April effect might, might, might have a financial year factor to it. Um, Obviously, the financial year starts, starts in April. Uh, and Kath, Kath was also asking whether you tried the negative binomial distribution instead of pass on approach. Um, I'll, I'll leave that question hanging because I don't think I can reinterpret it. Um, 
So yeah, uh, negative binomial is one of the ones that we are looking at um, in terms of uh, the potential better ways of providing input to the model. Um, and um, that's, that's a piece of work that my um, colleague Abigail Dutton is, is looking at at the moment. Um, she ended up, I, I'm, I'm, I say I'm not a proper statistician, she's ended up coming up with a, with a hideously complicated uh, input, which, which is far beyond me. But uh, as I say, negative binomial was certainly on the list of things she was she's testing. Um, and uh, she she's, says that she's managed to outperform the, the Poisson distribution in terms of the way that our hospital runs. Um, the April bump being the start of financial year, I, I fully appreciate that it, we, we always look for, for April bumps. I don't think it is um, because um, the way the hospital operates um, isn't quite so set up around, around financial years. I think um, certainly having worked as a, as a clinician in the hospital, that it more relates to um, there's a, a couple of years um, since I've been a consultant. I started in, in 2014, um, where we have had to just prospectively say we will stop elective surgery for a couple of weeks to let the hospital catch up. Um, and I think that's something that that happened in real life, but isn't in the model. Um, so I, I think that's that's where that problem has come from. Uh, and the, 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 the other sort of random and probably unhelpful thought is uh, years with two Easter's in, in April. Oh, or years, years with years, years with two Easter's in the same month. <laughs> I'm not, not, not sure how that, how that works, but that, that's, that's, uh, I don't know, that's, that's a factor as well. Um, I'll, I'll, I think a couple of people were interested in, in seeing um, your code and, and, and data, so a lot of families asked how, how um, accessible the code, code is. I've never seen I would call it accessible though. <laughs> it's physically there. Uh, but yeah, I, there, there's, there's the ICU model is very readable and I created a teaching package that goes through it quite nicely. So you can see the, the concept of how things work. The whole hospital model um, was written as I learned how to do R code and is not well documented. Um, Someone from NHS England has managed to look at it and understand it. Yes, that's it. Thank you. That's the ICU model. Um, the, the winter pressures model is is on the same GitHub account. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the whole hospital model is in theory understandable. And I've I've tried to put some information about about it, but uh, I apologise for how incoherent it is. Uh, yeah, no, it's nice. That's one that, that it, it shared. Um, and it's a related question from, from Kieran on, uh, so you shared the data to, to help others do work on COVID um, and he's asking, can, can others access the data? I'm not, I'm not quite sure whether Kieran's asking about the, uh, the sort of non-COVID data that you shared or, um, or any COVID related data. Uh, I'm, I'm certainly happy to discuss data sharing. The, the, the data that drives this model, unfortunately, is the SOS data. Yeah. Um, which isn't shareable, it's individual patient level data. Um, the ICU model there, um, I've got some synthetic data, which is actually based on, on real ICU data um, so that, that people can have the opportunity to try out the, the technique. Um, but yeah, the, the whole hospital model, I'm afraid you, you need SUS data um, from um, wherever you can get it. And I, I, I can't share the uh, the raw data um, because it is individual patient patient levels. Um, yeah, I think with, within the Department of Health, we've, we've just after, after probably three years of trying, we just managed to get our hands on some such data for, for, for modeling purposes so, so and, and understand the challenges. Um, so, so that, I, I, I think you, you, you're very, very modest about your sort of technical skills, Tom, but I think it was a really fascinating presentation. So, that, that, thank you very much. Um, I, 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 I just wondered, we've sort of had three presentations related to, to different aspects of simulation, and I just wanted to check with people on the call whether, whether there are any sort of general reflections um, or gen, general questions to, to, to all three um, pr presenters. Um, I, 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 suppose, I suppose my only sort of general question is, is whether, whether in, in sort of listening to what, how other people have approached this, whether there's sort of cross fertilization in diff, different different methods that, that, that can be um, reapplied in, in different settings. <laughs> 
Um, I'm not sure who I'm addressing that, addressing that to. But, um, and, and anyone who would like to comment. Certainly, I'm I'm a massive fan of uh, of cross pollination. Um, I I had uh, uh, an amazing meeting some years ago at the um, York Centre for Complex Systems Analysis, where they they bring people from all sorts of different arenas to to talk about things, and you you suddenly realise that a problem that you're working on in in healthcare has already been solved by biologists or geographers or or something like that. And I think it's 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 massively important to to have this kind of uh, cross fertilisation. Yeah, and no, I completely agree. Um, as I say, because I have a geography background, I definitely tend to approach things from quite a geography perspective. So a lot of focus on maps and that sort of thing. But um, definitely looking into some more models like the ones you guys have said would be definitely interesting. So thank you very much. Excellent. Well, so, um, so Tom and, and Karen are sharing links to um, the, the relevant so a question from Laura Thornley. Um, yeah, for, 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 I, I guess for, for, for any of the speakers, um, where, where, where would you start with simulation modelling um, if you're someone who, who doesn't get a lot of exposure in, uh, in your day to day role? I think if I can sort of paraphrase that slightly, if, 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 is, is for someone who, who wants to have a go at simulation modelling, ah, we have an answer from uh, from Kieran that, that uh, has recommended your, your tutorials, Tom. Yeah, I, I tried to present that and teach it in, in two hours at the NHSR conference, which uh, I think ended up just frightening people, but uh, um, I did create that that github um, icu model as a as teaching setup and it's got worked examples that go through um healthcare um that first vignette the bank one is actually one of the r simmer vignettes um so if you're if you're at all familiar with r i would highly recommend looking at r simmer and the vignettes on there um, which will take you through the general problem of um des modeling um, and uh, you know, as, as with my model, you can turn it into a kind of agent-based setup, although it's much better set up for, for um, DES. And then um, on that ICU model GitHub, um, you'll see that I've, take, I've created vignettes that go all the way through demonstrating this technique um, in particular to health healthcare modeling using routine data. And there's example routine data in there. And I think about uh, Five or six models of, of increased, gradually increasing complexity, modelling an ICU. Excellent. Um, so I, I, th I think, unless there are any any other sort of general sort of questions or comments, um, I, I think it just just remains to say th th thank you again to uh, Tom Verity and and, and Anne for, for, for three. three um, and uh, so they've, they've, used, they've used this word, but uh, there they were three fascinating presentations and some really some interesting material in there. So um, th thank you very much for that. And uh, um, yeah, very much appreciated on, on, on behalf of the group. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting us to talk. Uh, uh, yeah. Very much. Yeah, it's a, a pleasure. Yeah, so yeah, thank you. So um, I think so. so uh, you know, as, sorry, as Karen said, we, we haven't, haven't got the, the next meeting of the group scheduled in uh, yet. Yeah, there isn't likely to be another one uh, this calendar year. Um, the we, we, we've got a, a long list of ideas for, for uh, sessions for next year, um, and we're very 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 open to uh, sort of comments or observations on those from from. Um, from the members of the group uh, on which, which ones would be uh, a good priority. So I think on that note, I think that's um, that, that's, that's the end. Um, so uh, thank, thank you very much, everyone.